Kid Review Print Speaking to the Blind, celebrating 40 years of audio newspaper production. Welcome to this week's edition of the Herald Scotland podcast, recorded at the Bishop Briggs Media Centre by our amazing volunteers. You can get in touch with us via Facebook, Twitter or Instagram using at Kid Review, that is at symbol C-U-E-A-N-E-R-E-V-I-E-W. You can also contact us directly by emailing information at tunereview.com. That is I-N-F-O-R-M-A-T-I-O-N at symbol C-U-E-A-N-D-R-E-V-I-E-W dot C-O-M or by calling 0141 772 That's 0141 772 this is from the Herald on Wednesday the 1st of March 2023. This is from the news section. The headline reads, Hundreds of drinks producers sign up to Scotland's deposit scheme. This article is by David Ball. Drinks producers responsible for more than 95% of containers sold in Scotland have signed up for the deposit return scheme DRS ahead of the August launch date. Scheme administrator Circulators to Scotland welcomed the news the vast majority of producers have now registered online for the Scottish Government policy. SEPA, the scheme's regulator, has confirmed registration will remain open to enable all producers to sign up in time for the launch of the DRS on 16th of August. Circulators to Scotland confirmed that by midnight on 20th of February, producers responsible for more than 2 billion recyclable drinks containers had registered for the scheme representing more than 95% of the total volume of products sold in Scotland each year. More than 650 large, small and medium-sized producers have signed up to the scheme. Products from a range of sectors including global soft drinks, craft brewers, wine importers and distillers have been registered with the scheme. By 20th of February, 26,000 products have been registered, illustrating the scale of the scheme and the choice that will exist for consumers. Circulatory Scotland Chief Executive David Harris said this is a fantastic start and a real landmark for the deposit return scheme which is set to deliver groundbreaking environmental benefits to Scotland. I would like to warmly welcome and thank all those producers who have registered for the scheme and emphasise that our team of experts are on hand to continue supporting registration. We have never underestimated the challenge of delivering a scheme which requires the support of so many Scottish businesses. They will all be helping us to reach the goal of recycling billions of pet plastic, glass and metal drinks containers a year. We're now well on the way to achieving that vital ambition. I would encourage those producers who have begun their registration to complete it as soon as possible and can assure those producers who have yet to sign up that we have people on hand to support them through the process. That article was by David Ball. This is from the Herald on Wednesday the 1st of March 2023. This is from the news section. The headline reads, Meet Humour, the Glasgow ban taking America by storm. The article is by Alex Burns. South by Southwest Festival, SXSW in Austin, Texas, has had some impressive names on its lineup over the years. Kanye West, Bruce Springsteen, Dolly Parton, Lana Del Rey and even Barack Obama have previously appeared at this major festival of music, film and conferences held over 10 days in March. Now, you can add the Scottish post-punk band Humour to that list after the quintet were revealed as performers at the 2023 festival. An amalgamation of Scottish influences, the band members hail from Edinburgh and Perth but were formed in Glasgow where they met while studying together at university. They performed in various guises over the years, but it was while locked down together during the COVID pandemic, they are flatmates as well as bandmates, that they have really found their sound. And the punky, somewhat manic music that they have created together has clearly worked. NME named Humour as one of their essential emerging artists for 2023 and hailed their superbly exciting debut EP. Being based in Glasgow, a city renowned for its live music scene, has helped in part with Humour's rapid rise to recognition. Music-wise, there is so much going on in Glasgow, explains guitarist Roz Patrizio. That's why we have stayed in the city. We have met so many of our friends here 
through music and it's inspiring to be around that. It's a great society to be making music in. Despite being in their infancy as a band, Humour have already played famous Scottish venues like Glasgow's King Tut's Wawa Hut and Sneaky Pete's in Edinburgh, as well as gigs across France and the Netherlands. We pretty much had interest from Europe straight away, explains bassist Louis Doig. We signed to an independent record label who were great in terms of distribution and being able to get our music into places we have never reached before. We were excited to go to France, but we were kind of expected to play to empty rooms, adds lead vocalist Andreas Christy Dodelis. So it was nice surprise to get there and find the gigs full. It does seem that in Europe people are more willing to go to a gig of a band that they haven't heard of before. South by Southwest will be their biggest gig to date. It was a very 21st century moment when they found out they were playing there. Patrizio explains with drummer Rory Smith forwarding on a screenshot to the band's WhatsApp group that said South by Southwest accepting artist. And while the band were very excited to play there, the practical he's of getting from Glasgow to Texas have proven tricky without major financial backing. They've launched a crowdfunder campaign to help pay for the trip and held a fundraiser gig in Glasgow. We regularly discuss how to balance our work commitments with the band, but the reality of it is that music isn't a very well-paid career, Patricio acknowledges. When it comes to the long-term ambitions for humour, he says they're taking it week by week and seeing how things go, but there's something quite nice about the band not being our job, he adds. Later this year, humour are booked to play at the Otherlands Festival at Scone Palace near Perth, which Doy describes as very special for him as it is a short distance away from where he grew up. But when it comes to the venue they would most like to play, the band's answer is unanimous. The iconic Barland Ballroom in Glasgow's East End. It's near our flat. It's the best sounding venue. Every gig I've been to there has been very special, explains Patrizio. And at the rate humour are going, it surely won't be long until that dream becomes a reality. That article was by Alex Burns. This is from the Herald on Wednesday the 1st of March 2023. This is from the news section. The headline reads, PM urged to extend EU market access for Northern Ireland to Scotland. The article is by Tom Gordon. Rishi Sunak has been pressed to explain why EU single market access is good for Northern Ireland but is being denied to the rest of the UK by Brexit. Appearing tetchy and uncomfortable at PMQs, the Prime Minister accused SNP Westminster leader Stephen Flynn of playing politics for even asking the question. He said it was disappointing that he had done so. On Monday, the PM signed the Windsor Framework with European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen to overhaul the Northern Ireland Protocol. The changes are intended to simplify the post-Brexit trading arrangements for the province, cutting checks on goods between GB and NI and creating a possible veto on new EU laws. To avoid a hard border with the Irish Republic, Northern Ireland has a unique status in the UK with access to the EU single market as well as the UK internal market. In a bid to sell the deal to sceptical unionists and Tory MPs, Mr Sunak visited County Antrim yesterday where he said the deal would create the world's most exciting economic zone. He said... If we get this right, if we get this framework implemented, if we get the executive back up and running here, Northern Ireland is in the unbelievably special position, unique position in the entire world, European continent, and having privileged access not just to the UK home market, which is enormous, but also the European Union single market. Nobody else has that, no one, only you guys, only here, and that is the prize. It led to questions about why Mr Sunak was championing Brexit if staying in the EU single market was such a bonus. At PMQs, Mr Flynn quoted the PM's description of single market access as special, exciting and attractive, before adding, if that's the case, why is he denying it to the rest of us? Mr Sunak replied, it's disappointing that the Honourable Gentleman is seeking to play politics with the situation in Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland, as he well knows, has a unique place in the United Kingdom, and what we are trying to do is restore the balance inherent and the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, and he would do well to acknowledge that. But Mr Flynn went on, let's be clear, what the Prime Minister said yesterday was that the EU single market access will be a good thing for business. Now, of course, that's in contrast to the leader of the Labour Party, who said in December 
that EU single market access would not boost economic growth? Does it hurt the Prime Minister to know that the Labour Party believe in Brexit more than he does? Amid laughter from MPs, Mrs Sunak, an enthusiastic Leave supporter, again refused to engage in the wider question about the merit of Brexit. He said, With regard to Northern Ireland, the important thing to know is to avoid a land border on the island of Ireland between North and South. That is what is crucial to achieve in getting the right framework for the arrangements in Northern Ireland. And the businesses there that trade across the border on a daily basis with complex supply chains need and value that access. That is something that the Windsor Framework has sought to achieve and I believe delivers it. It's not that it's not about the macro issue of membership of the European Union. It's about getting the right mechanisms in place to support businesses and communities in Northern Ireland. And I would say to the Honourable Gentleman, he knows better than that. He knows that this is about Northern Ireland and I hope that he can support what we've agreed. Northern Ireland MP Colm Eastwood, leader of the Nationalist SDLP, also chided Mr Sunak, saying it was great to hear the conversion that the Prime Minister has had on the benefits of the single market. SNP MP Joanna Cherry Casey also raised the special post-Brexit status of Northern Ireland and asked why it couldn't also be applied to Scotland. She said, The Prime Minister has boasted that his new Brexit deal puts Northern Ireland in an unbelievably special position because it will have access to both the UK and the EU markets. And he said, that this makes it the world's most exciting economic zone. So my question for the Prime Minister is this. If there can be a very, very special status for the province of Northern Ireland, why can't there be a very, very special status for the nation of Scotland? Again, refusing to engage with the substance of the question, Mr Sunak replied, there is a very special status for the nation of Scotland, and that's inside our United Kingdom. The article was by Tom Gordon. Herald Scotland recorded on... Thursday, 2nd of March, 2023. Arts and Entertainments. Review. Scottish Chamber Orchestra stroke Amelia Anichiff by Keith Bruce. Five stars. It's tempting to draw a parallel between the relationship that created Brahms' violin concerto between the composer and virtuoso Joseph Joachim and the one we saw on stage between soloist Eileen Pritchin and the Scottish Chamber Orchestra's principal conductor, Maxim Amelia Anichiff who are chums from their studies together at the Moscow Conservatoire. But while Brahms and Joachim met as teenagers, they were well into middle age when the work was written, while the contemporary partnership is yet of young men. Not that you might have guessed from the maturity of this performance. The SCO has a distinguished history of playing Brahms with celebrated recordings of the symphonies by Charles Macarus and Robin Ticciati in its catalogue. But this programme, which followed the concerto with the first of those symphonies, showed that Emily Anichev is in no way daunted by that legacy. For those familiar with, for example, Nicola Benedetti's performances of the violin concerto with the RSNO, this was an entirely different sound world, the soloist ensemble using gut strings in the warmth of their rich tone, teamed with a poise and precision in their phrasing. The tiggerish conductor may have been bouncing in the balls of his feet as usual, but he often seemed to be signalling restraint to his players and his tempi throughout were very measured. As for Pritchin, his first movement, Cadenza, was full of emotional and dynamic range, and he settled into a relaxed conversation with the winds in the adagio before the expressive gypsy dance of the finale, in which the instruction, Manon Troppo Vivace, was meticulously obeyed. The crisp playing of the SCO strings and the spaciousness of the sound was nothing short of revelatory. For his encore, the soloist then produced a lyrical largo from a Bach sonata, that was also all about feeling rather than mere technique. The conductor's way with the symphony was from the same mould. Out of the blocks, as soon as he arrived in front of the orchestra, there was nonetheless an unhurried and stately quality to the slow movement and a very incremental build-up to the scherzo. Throughout, the softer sounds of the gut strings and muted quality to the pizzicato passages made this a masterclass in historically informed performance that was simultaneously as far from po-faced as is possible. By Keith Bruce. This is from The National on Friday the 3rd of March 2023. From the news section. John Swinney to quit government after nearly 16 years. This article is written by Ross Hunter. John Swinney is to stand down as a minister following the SNP's leadership election. 
In a letter to Nicola Sturgeon, posted on Twitter, Swinney described serving in government since 2007 as the privilege of my life. However, he added that when a new First Minister is elected later this month, he will step down as Deputy First Minister, a role he has held since 2014, and serve as an MSP from the back benches. He wrote, It has been the privilege of my life to serve in the Scottish Government since 2007 as a Cabinet Secretary, with responsibility first for finance and the economy, then education and skills, and finally Covid recovery. It has been an honour to serve Scotland as your Deputy First Minister since 2014. When I joined the Scottish National Party at the age of 15 in 1979, our political prospects were poor and I could scarcely have imagined that over so many years I would have the opportunity to serve Scotland in government in the way I have. In all that I have undertaken in government, I have tried to listen carefully to different views and be open to the ideas and thoughts of people in Scotland. I have sought always to transform the life of chances of everyone who lives here. I have acted to make Scotland a fairer, more prosperous and more confident country that I believe would be assured with independence. He added, these have been demanding commitments to fulfil over nearly 16 years and I have decided that when the First Minister is appointed later in March, I will stand down from government. I will continue to faithfully represent my constituents in Perthshire North and look forward to sitting with you on the back benches of the Scottish Parliament to continue our contribution to Scotland's cause. In her reply, Nicola Sturgeon said she could not have wished for a better partner in government. She said, Your contribution to our nation, almost 16 years in government, is considerable, indeed unique. Therefore, while I, perhaps more than most, completely understand your decision, I still feel a real sense of sadness when you told me of it. Over almost 16 years in government, more than eight years as Deputy First Minister, indeed, the longest serving Deputy First Minister so far, you have made countless contributions to the good of our people and our country. In short, I could not have wished for a better partner in government than you, and there is no doubt that our Scottish Government would have achieved much less had you not been in it. Please accept my thanks for your support, wisdom and, above all, friendship, as together with Ministers past and present, we sought to make Scotland a better place. As I said when I announced my own departure from office, serving as First Minister has been the privilege of my life, Having done so with you by my side as Deputy First Minister has been an honour. As for the future, I know you will continue to serve Scotland well and that you will be, as you always have been, a source of good advice and wise counsel to our party, government and movement. I look forward to this new phase for both of us as we move to the backbenches and make way for the new generation who will now lead Scotland forward. Leadership candidate Humza Yousaf, who was at SNP's first leadership hustings on Wednesday, described Swinney as one of his best friends in politics, also paid tribute to Swinney's contributions in government. He said, John is a true giant of the SNP and the independence movement. Our party and our government owe much of our success to John's hard work, from securing the council tax freeze in the early days of government to expanding childcare as Education Secretary, finding the funds to help households through the cost of living crisis and enabling me to deliver fair pay for our NHS in recent weeks. John has long represented the good in our politics, his ability to win the respect of people from all political persuasions while passionately advocating his cause is an example everyone in politics should aspire to. On a personal level, he has always been a source of advice and support to me in good times and bad, from my days as a young activist to becoming colleagues around the Cabinet table. John would be any First Minister's top pick to be in the Cabinet, but I respect the reasons he has outlined for standing down from Government once the First Minister demits office. K 
Kate Forbes said that she had valued Swinney's advice to her over the years and wished him well for the future. I have such respect and admiration for John Swinney. John Swinney is not only an incredibly able politician who has put public service at the heart of his career, he's also somebody who I'd call a friend. He's a friend to many MSPs and I have valued enormously his advice and guidance over the years. I wish him well because he has put in some shift. That article was written by Ross Hunter. This is from The National on Friday the 3rd of March 2023 from the News section. Majority of Scots support introduction of deposit return scheme. This article is written by Ross Hunter. Seven out of ten Scots support the introduction of deposit return on drink bottles and cans in Scotland, a new poll has found. While the Scottish Government has come under fire from some in the drinks industry over plans to introduce a deposit return scheme, DRS, in August, 86% of people surveyed said they would use it either some or all of the time. The initiative will see shoppers charge a 20p deposit on all drinks, brought in single-use cans and bottles, with this cash refunded to them once they bring the empty containers back for recycling. It is hoped the scheme will boost recycling rates and reduce littering, with 90% agreeing littering is a problem in Scotland. The poll was conducted by the Diffley Partnership, with director and founder Mark Diffley saying the results of the survey were clear and unambiguous and showed strong public support for the DRS among all sections of the population. The survey, carried out for Tomra, a firm which produces reverse vending machines, used to return empty bottles, found 72% wanted to see DRS introduced across the UK. The UK government has put forward its own proposals for a similar scheme, which is not due to come into force until 2025, with 65% of people questioned pleased Scotland is to be the first part of the UK to have such a system. Of the 1,080 people who were questioned, 42% said they would use DRS all the time, with 44% saying that they would participate in the scheme sometimes, but not all the time. Meanwhile, only 14% said they would never use it. Fewer than a fifth of people were opposed to the initiative, with 8% saying they would somewhat oppose it, while 10% described themselves as being strongly opposed to it. In contrast, 43% said they strongly supported the introduction of DRS, with 27% saying they were somewhat supporting it. The biggest driver encouraging people to use the scheme is to prevent damage to the natural environment and animals, with this cited as a reason by 53%. Mr Diffley said, The data in this polling is clear and unambiguous, showing strong public support for DRS among all sections of the population. There appears to be a strong correlation between environmental concerns and support for DRS, with support for the scheme being particularly high among those who are most concerned about climate change and who are motivated to use the scheme by a desire to stop damage to the environment. SNP leadership candidate Ash Regan has said she would scrap the scheme in its current form if she is elected. Kate Forbes has said it should be paused while Humza Yousaf pledged to bring in an exemption for small businesses for the first year of operation. John Lee, Vice President for Public Affairs for the UK and Ireland at Tomra, said the firm wanted to ensure businesses and consumers are aware and prepared for the changes. He added, As part of our work, we were keen to understand public opinion on the ground in Scotland and the data gathered by the Diffley Partnership is extremely useful in helping us to understand that. International evidence suggests that DRS could reduce litter by a third, thereby increasing Scotland's chances of meeting our climate change targets and Tomra's experience across Europe suggests that the recycling return rate 
will be anywhere between 92% and 98%. We are here to offer our knowledge and experience to ensure that Scotland's journey to DRS is as smooth as it can be. Lorna Slater, the Scottish Greens Minister in charge of introducing the DRS scheme, said It's no surprise to see the public are firmly in favour of Scotland's deposit return scheme, which is a major part of our efforts to reduce littering, cut emissions and address the climate emergency. On track to launch in August, Scotland's DRS will reduce littering by a third and CO2 emissions by 4 million tonnes over 25 years. That's equivalent to taking 83,000 cars off the road and it is just the latest in a series of successful examples in countries like Denmark, Germany and Canada. Businesses have also voted with their feet with 664 drinks producers representing over 90% of the total volume of drinks containers sold in Scotland each year, already registered for the scheme. They don't want broken bottles or plastic litter on our streets, parks and beaches either, and they recognise that this scheme is the way to end that blight. That article was written by Ross Hunter. This is from The Herald on Thursday the 2nd of March 2023, from the news section. Nature Scott agrees £2 billion private finance deal. This article is written by Caroline Wilson. Scotland's taxpayer-funded Nature Agency has agreed a £2 billion private finance deal to restore native woodland and capture 28 million tonnes of greenhouse gases over the next 30 years. Nature Scott said the first of its kind agreement with the UK private bank Hamden & Co, Lombard Odia Investment Managers and global impact firm Palladium would establish the country as a world leader in nature restoration through natural capital investment. It said the Scottish Government has significantly increased investment but a huge increase in private funding was needed to tackle the twin crisis of nature and the climate. Nature Scott said the money could be in the form of loans to private landlords, NGOs and public bodies for projects, but other investment models such as equity investment are also on the table. It said that the plan would create new jobs and support rural communities across all parts of Scotland. However, the pilot scheme has been heavily criticised by the think tank Common Wheel which said it amounted to privatising Scotland's trees. A spokeswoman said, Selling carbon credits, but it's not greenwashing. Will the Scottish Government never learn? Less than two years after Audit Scotland made a blistering assessment of how much harm had been done by the privatisation of Scotland's public buildings and the revelations on how much has been lost after the cack-handed privatisation of Scotland's offshore wind, now they're going to privatise Scotland's trees? Scotland is truly becoming a playground for the rich, where the government creates more and more schemes to help them use their wealth to make even more money off the back of Scotland's national assets. Citizens really must scratch their heads and wonder where they fit into this oligarchy. The Scottish Conservatives said the plan was welcome news for the environment, local jobs and rural communities, but questioned the significant change of direction by Biodiversity Minister Laura Slater and the SNP Green Coalition. Liam Kerr, Scottish Conservative Shadow Cabinet Secretary for Net Zero Energy and Transport, said, Until now, she and her colleagues have shown no sign of realising that there are any positive aspects to business and private investment. Notably, her party isn't just hostile towards private companies, it's actually explicitly opposed to growth. Lorna Slater should explain why she's suddenly in favour of such economic arrangements and in what other areas we can expect to see them in future. If they finally realise that it's economic growth that will make this woodland growth possible, it will be the first sensible decision the Greens have made in years. Nature Scott said the investment will go straight to the projects 
and said it was not currently speaking to the investments about the land it owns, but may do so in the future. The first pilot scheme will begin in the spring, and is centred on the upper catchment of the River Tweed in southern Scotland. It will build on momentum already generated by the Wild Heart Borders Forest Trust project. The initial scoping assessment has identified the potential for around 30,000 hectares of new native woodland in the heart of southern Scotland, with the potential for between 200 and 300 million pounds of private investment and around 6 million tonnes of carbon sequestration. The next phase of work will involve developing the funding model further and engaging with land managers and communities to explore what might be possible. Biodiversity Minister Lorna Slater said, The finance gap for nature in Scotland for the next decade has been estimated to be £20 billion. Leveraging responsible private investment through valuable partnerships like this will be absolutely vital to meeting our climate targets and restoring our natural environment. Scotland is well placed to take a leading role by offering investors the opportunity to generate sustainable returns from the restoration and regeneration of our landscapes. This investment will generate multiple benefits, ending the loss of biodiversity, improving water quality, reducing the risk of flooding, regenerating local communities and creating green jobs. Robbie Kernahan, Director for Green Economy at Nature Scott, added, we're delighted to be working with these businesses to deliver scalable investment in our natural capital in Scotland. To deliver the aims of the Climate Change Plan, we need to bring private investment to Scotland and this new partnership will allow us to test a new approach. A Scottish Government spokesperson said, The Scottish Government has already significantly increased public investment in nature restoration through, for example, a £65 million nature restoration fund. But public investment can't do it alone. The finance gap for nature in Scotland for the next decade has been estimated to be £20 billion. That's why we're working to find ways to bridge this finance gap through leveraging responsible private finance. Our interim principles for responsible investment in natural capital, published last year, will help to ensure that investment is ethical and values-led, socially responsible, meets high standards of integrity and includes benefits for local communities. That means a focus on nature-based solutions like peatland restoration and woodland creation in places and ways which bring benefits for the environment, the economy and society as a whole. That article was written by Caroline Wilson. This is from the Herald on Thursday the 2nd of March 2023 from the news section. Two thirds of Scott's GP appointments now done face to face. This article is written by Helen McArdle. Around two thirds of GP appointments in Scotland were being carried out face to face by the end of last year, according to the most detailed analysis of the trends to date. The figures compiled by Public Health Scotland from 856 of Scotland 912 practices show that the total number of GP consultations, both in person and virtual, has returned to pre-pandemic levels after years of disruption caused by Covid. By 2022, an average of 1.6 million appointments were taking place each month, matching the levels seen in 2018 and 2019 with the proportion of patients seen face-to-face -face gradually increasing, from 60% in January last year to 67% by November and 66% in December. However, Public Health Scotland notes that technical errors means that some telephone consultations may have been incorrectly coded as in-person. In the two years prior to Covid, Around 83-86% to 86 of appointments were done face-to-face, -face, but this was dramatically scaled back during the first lockdown in April 2020, when half the 1.2 million consultations carried out by GPs 
were done remotely via telephone, email or online video calls. Dr Andrew Boost, chair of the BMA's Scottish GP committee, said that Public Health Scotland figures should bring an end to any of the previous erroneous and in some cases pernicious suggestions that issues with access are to do with GPs somehow not working hard enough. He warned that a mismatch between demand and capacity is causing huge problems for practices across Scotland. However, with Scotland's GP workforce having shrunk by 3.3% in real terms since 2019 and Audit Scotland warning last week that a goal to recruit an extra 800 GPs by the end of 2027 is not on track. Dr Boost added, As the system continues to adjust to post-pandemic realities, two-thirds of GP activity was in person as of September 2022. This is not as high as pre-pandemic, but reflects a return to more face-to-face -face work, balanced against the realities of attempting to meet demand through a hybrid model in the most effective way possible. Dr Chris Williams, Joint Chair for the Royal College of GPs Scotland, said patients should have access to an appropriate mix of appointment types and booking methods, but that the ability to provide this is dictated by capacity within each general practice which is stretched. He added, for some patients, telephone or virtual appointments are the most appropriate and desirable form of consultation with their GP. For others, face-to-face -face remains the preferred format. GPs remain committed to treating their patients in the most appropriate way possible. In England, controversial league tables have ranked GP practices based on access including the percentage of appointments carried out face-to-face. -face. In Scotland, Public Health Scotland said it is not currently possible to reliably compare practices because they do not record data consistently. Dr Williams said RCGP would not support the publication of divisive practice-by-practice -practice comparisons. Too often that approach fails to consider or properly represent the needs, demographics or patient numbers of a practice, said Dr Williams. Such a situation is not helpful for patients in making informed decisions about their care and may cause patients to lose confidence in their GP. It is crucial that a division between practices and patients not to be allowed to form as it has in England. It comes after experts called on policymakers to urgently invest in training for safe remote consulting following the tragic case in England of David Nash, a 26-year-old law student who died following four telephone consultations for a painful ear infection which led to a fatal brain abscess. A coroner ruled in January that he was likely to have lived if he had been given a face-to-face -face appointment. Writing in the BMJ, Dr Rebecca Rosen, a GP and Senior Fellow in Health Policy for the Nuffield Trust think tank, and Tricia Greenhalgh, a Professor of Primary Care Health Sciences at Oxford University, said Mr Nash's experience should be a rallying call to those responsible for safety in general practice. They added, attending to the patient's sense of urgency is key but giving patients the right to demand an in-person appointment may not be the best solution to a system-wide problem. Updated professional guidance on remote consulting and rules of thumb for switching from remote to in-person assessments are essential next steps for safely incorporating remote care into everyday practice. However, Dr Rosen and Professor Greenhalgh also noted that compared with England, GPs in Scotland had much higher usage of video consultation, which they say adds valuable visual information in situations of clinical uncertainty, for example, when assessing the severity of an ill child out of hours. Some patients also prefer the convenience of a remote appointment. However, Mark O'Donnell, Chief Executive of Age Scotland, cautioned that while they can be a useful alternative, there are still huge numbers of older people in Scotland who cannot or just aren't comfortable using the internet, who may face communication barriers and find it very difficult to explain their medical concerns without examination. 
He said for these patients, the fall in number of available face-to-face -face GP appointments has proved challenging. And we've heard from older people having difficulty when securing an in-person appointment or consultation due to high demand and lengthy waiting times. We hope to see continued effort to ensure those who need or prefer in-person appointments can access them promptly. Mr O'Donnell added that information on how access to face-to-face -to -face appointments vary between health boards would be useful along with some analysis of whether digital or telephone appointments are proving more efficient. That article was written by Helen McArdle. The Herald, Friday the 3rd of March 2023. News. Highland Council unveils Council Tax Second Homes Plan. This article is by Caroline Wilson. Council tax revenue ring-fenced for affordable housing could be used to plug a £49 million budget black hole in an area facing chronic shortages of homes. Local authorities are required to invest the first 50% of income generated from second homes and the long-term empty properties in housing. Highland Council leader Raymond Bremner wrote to the Deputy First Minister John Swinney asking for permission to repurpose this income over the next two years as it negotiates its biggest ever funding shortfall and his request was approved. The local authority is forecasting a budget deficit of £126.9 million over the next five years and says the largest element of this gap, £49.2 million, falls in the coming year and will require substantial transformative activity. Mr Bremner said people in the Highlands were facing some of the highest rises in the cost of living. A 4% uplift in council tax was agreed at yesterday's budget meeting, one of the lowest in Scotland. He said a lack of clarity from the Scottish Government over flexibilities in ring-fenced funding was confounding the perfect storm of inflation at the highest levels, rising interest rates and a cost-of-living crisis. The move to redirect council tax revenue from second homes is expected to generate £3.4 million annually. SNP leadership candidate Hamza Yousaf said earlier this week that he would back increasing council tax on second homes to encourage them back into full-time use by owners. The council insists the temporary measure would not impact on the delivery of affordable housing and have been agreed in previous years by the Scottish Government. However, it comes amid warnings that a shortage of affordable homes in the Highlands and Islands is driving workers away and hampering growth in lucrative industries, as well as pricing local people out of the market. Salmon Scotland, the trade body for Scotland's farm-raised sector, which sustains 12,500 local jobs and brings in nearly £800 million a year for the economy, warned last week that housing shortages are holding back real growth. Farming companies already provide accommodation for 130 employees and their families after buying or renting suitable housing, and many workers simply cannot find homes near where they work. Shelter Scotland said it is concerned about chronically underfunded local authority housing services, given the cuts to social housing funding in the recent budget. Registers of Scotland data shows that while average prices across Scotland rose by 89% in 2022 compared to the 2004 baseline, the increase was 107% in the Highlands. The average price of a home has gone from £108,000 £106 in 2004 
to £223,196 in 2022. There are concerns that a high concentration of second homes can increase house prices, reducing supply for local people. However, research by independent think tank, SPICE, Scottish Parliament Information Centre, found there may be some benefits. Second homeowners tend to be wealthier than those that don't own second homes, and if they regularly spend money in the local area, this may benefit local businesses. Second homes used as holiday lets can also be crucial to support local tourist economies. Highland Council said the Scottish Government was becoming increasingly directive in how the local authority deploys its funds. The Council is investing an extra £20 million on road repairs and a rapid response service for pothole repairs, while payments to kinship and foster carers will be increased to keep Highland children in the Highlands. However, cuts to a number of charitable groups were criticised by opposition councillors, in particular the loss of £65,000 for SNAP, Special Needs Action Project in Inverness, and a £9,000 drop in funding for La Caber Music School, which has been operating for 36 years. Previous alumni have gone on to play with the RSNO, Scottish Opera and Scottish Ballet. Angus MacDonald, Liberal Democrat councillor, said people were drawn to the Highlands because of beauty, of our scenery, the charm of our people and culture and traditions. And reductions in funding for groups such as this threaten to erode this. Mr Bremner said we are facing a perfect storm of circumstances with inflation at the highest levels, rising interest rates and a cost of living crisis. This is confounded by uncertainty around future pressures and risks and a lack of clarity on ring-fenced funding. In setting this budget, we have tried to be fair. We have focused on removing duplication and over provision and making sure our services are affordable. He added, we have carefully considered where we target our spending and have chosen to invest in improving our roads, reducing our waste, supporting children and families and protecting jobs. This article is by Caroline Wilson. The Herald, Friday the 3rd of March 2023. News. McGill's buses, James and Sandy Easdale, in £20 million electric vehicle drive. This article is by Ian McConnell. McGill's buses, owned by former Rangers directors Sandy and James Easdale, is introducing a further 41 new electric buses to its fleet in a £20 million investment. The company noted it had now announced investment in electric fleet totalling £55 million since the end of 2021, which it said placed it in the top three companies in the UK for fleet decarbonisation. McGill's now has a total of 109 electric buses accounting for nearly 20% of its fleet, with McGill's noting there would be further purchases to follow. The majority of the new buses will be used around Inverclyde and Renfrewshire, with the new vehicles also being deployed in Ayrshire and Dundee through Explore Dundee. As part of the latest vehicle investment, McGill's has also financed substantial infrastructure upgrades at four of its depots to enable charging and maintenance of the electric fleet. A training programme is underway to upskill vehicle technicians to support the next generation of buses entering service. 
James Easdale, chairman of McGill's Group, said, This is the latest milestone investment for McGill's Group as we seek to get more people viewing bus travel as a go-to option. The purchase of an additional 41 new electric vehicles is not only important for the environment as Scotland pursues its net zero target, but also serves our passengers and the wider economy. We have also invested heavily in infrastructure and training. Sandy Easdale, McGill's Group Director, said McGill's has one of the most modern bus fleets in the UK and we intend to build on this as we phase out older vehicles, particularly in our recently acquired McGill's Scotland East business. James and I have invested substantially not only in vehicles, but also growing the business by expanding our reach across Scotland. The company is also seeing hugely positive results from our long-distance coach partnership with Flixbus. We firmly intend to continue this upbeat approach into the future. This article is by Ian McConnell. The Herald on the 3rd of March and the Voices section. Opinion. The choice for the SNP may be between party or country by Andy McIver. We are not used to this, are we? For the first time since the SNP has been in government, there is a leadership contest and it bears all the hallmarks of a contest for which nobody was well prepared. The outcome of that has been somewhat chaotic, and not all the characteristic of a party which was hitherto known for being a slick, world-class campaigning and electoral machine. The first leadership hustings on Wednesday evening in Cumbernauld had more of the feel of a hastily constructed community council meeting rather than a convention to help decide Scotland's next first minister. In amongst that chaos had been the pointed, sometimes vitriolic, arguments which the candidates and their campaigns are playing out in public. For the first time in many people's living memory, the SNP is arguing in front of the children. That in itself is not necessarily a lingering problem. The Conservative and Labour parties have both done this in recent times, and both have, to some degree or other, proven able to glue themselves to back together. However, in the substance of the arguments, there may lie an existential problem for the party. There is a chasm in the SNP which has raised the question, in my mind at least, as to whether the unity of the party and the ability to create a majority in favour of independence are two concepts working in opposition to one another. Without wishing to sideline Ash Reagan, because the limited polling conducted so far indicates she will not win, The focus has been on the differing viewpoints of Kate Forbes and Humza Yousaf. And it's becoming increasingly clear that these viewpoints dither not on a single piece of legislation such as gender recognition reform, GRR, or on a single tactic to gain independence, but on the foundations of their entire political ideologies. Mr Yousaf is firmly established as the continuity candidate. He has long been thought of as the choice of the current incumbent, Nicola Sturgeon, and her statements since the eruption caused by the entry into the campaign of Ms Forbes have done nothing to change that presumption. Indeed, she has either tacitly or explicitly been joined by the Deputy First Minister, John Swinney, along with a swathe of other Cabinet Secretaries, Ministers and MSPs. Privately, they will all tell you the same thing. Only Hamza can hold the party together. Not just the party, of course, but the cooperation agreement with the Greens. Because of Mrs Forbes' opposition to GRR, if the Greens stay true to their word, then her election will instantly lead to their withdrawal from the agreement, which Mr Yousaf has lauded as an important example of so-called progressive politics, and of course of the independence movement working together. The party box is ticked, and the green box is ticked, but what about Mr Yousaf's beliefs? Well, we know enough to say that he's firmly a man of the left. He did make it clear this week that he believed in economic growth, distinction from his green partners, but otherwise he is a firm supporter of the Scottish Government's status quo position of relatively high taxes, 
a presumption in favour of universal taxpayer funding of services, centrally controlled public services, and so on. In this country, it's called the Scottish National Party, but without the constitutional cling film around the politics, there would be another name for it, the Labour Party. We know enough, even after these first 10 days, to know that Ms Forbes is different. The SNP, as a governing party, may be largely of the left, and the seismic intake of mainly young urban members since the 2014 independence referendum appears to drive it even further in that direction. However, despite being the youngest candidate, Ms Forbes appears to be cut from a more traditional SNP cloth. She is proactively and unashamedly in favour of an entrepreneurial growth economy. Her first major campaign speech was made in, at a small business in the north, and she has talked about SMEs as the backbone of our economy on multiple occasions. One gets the impression she would feel much more home, at home at the local farmer's market than at a meeting of the Glasgow University branch of SMP students. She also clearly values large businesses and is conscious of bolstering key sectors of the Scottish economy. Most notably, most notably, she has made clear her disagreement with the strategy being incrementally pushed by the Scottish Government towards keeping oil and gas reserves in the ground. Her reliance on the principles set by former German Chancellor Angela Merkel in voting with her conscience but pushing through legislation with which she disagrees shows us a deeper alliance. Like Ms. Mrs Merkel, Kate Forbes is not a woman of the left. That this fact is so unusual and let us be clear, deemed by some in the SNP to be unacceptable, is a portrayal of the scale of shift in the SNP, particularly since 2014. This is a party which, for all the talk of it being the broadest of churches, is actually being narrowed to the left by its elected representation. In a few short weeks we will know if its membership agrees. If it does, we must return to the question of whether the party and cause are opposed. To use numbers rather crudely, 40% of this country will vote yes at any future referendum and 40% will vote no. What matters is what that soft, malleable 20% does. In 2014, they largely voted no and largely because they did not see a credible economic position from the yes movement. There must be a large question mark placed over whether these soft unionists will see it see it in a government led by Mr Yousaf and the Greens, or whether they could more easily be brought over the line by Ms Forbes' focus on the issues atop their priority list. If the conclusion to this contest is that Mr Yousaf can unite the party but not the country, and Ms Forbes can unite the country but not the party, then the SNP may need to loosen its grip on the notion that it must remain united for independence to be won. Perhaps it must not. Perhaps there must be more than one midwife of an independent Scotland. That was by Andy McIver. From the Herald Scotland, Monday the 6th of March 2023, from the business section, business briefing, Edinburgh Rose Theatre put up for sale by Danish owner, by Brian Donnelly. A Scottish theatre has been put up for sale by its owner, the Danish choreographer and director Peter Schaufus. The Rose Theatre in Edinburgh was described as having been a successful fringe venue since Mr Schaufus transformed the former Charlotte Methodist Chapel. He purchased the building in 2016 and opened a year later after a £1.8 million conversion. Agent Rettie & Co said, The Rose Theatre is a grade B listed building, originally built in 1912 as a church and converted into an operational theatre and arts centre in 2018. The venue has alcohol licence, including a late 3am licence on Friday and Saturday during the Fringe and Hogmanay, and has a proven record of accomplishment of attracting successful productions from companies such as Gilded Balloon, Captivate and Classical Events Limited. It said it offers a unique opportunity at a guide price of £3 million. The property is spread over five levels, with the third floor featuring a self-contained caretaker's flat with stunning uninterrupted views of the castle. Situated ideally in the heart of Edinburgh's new town and prominently in the western end of Rose Street, Rose Theatre occupies an envious location within the city centre, Reddy said. 
The immediate surrounding buildings are, are in a mix of uses with a wide variety of hospitality venues, hotels, retail, offices and residential. Neighbours include the Kimpton and Waldorf Astoria Hotels and the Johnny Walker Whiskey Experience. Mr Schaufus was quoted in an all Edinburgh theatre as saying, I sincerely hope that it will be bought by another creative operator within the industry that can take the venue further forward. And that report was by Brian Donnelly. From the Herald Scotland, Monday the 6th of March 2023, from the business section, Travel Agent Barhead flags new jobs as Gordon Street store opens by Ian McConnell, Group Business Editor. Barhead Travel today celebrated the opening of its new flagship store on Gordon Street in Glasgow, following a record-breaking start to the year for holiday bookings and highlighted expectations of creating further jobs. The travel agent reported that bookings remain higher than pre-pandemic levels as it officially opened the store. More than 35 travel specialists with various areas of expertise, will be based at the flagship store. Barhead Travel said it expects to add further positions this year, including apprenticeships as demand continues to soar. The new 4,000 square foot store is split across two levels, with an experience-led retail space in the ground floor, and the first floor becoming a dedicated hub for its specialist sales divisions, including crews, long haul and Canada departments. An event space, a training room and private appointment space for clients looking for in-depth consultations are among other features of the new store. The new Gordon Street location will also trial the first paperless storefront for Barhead Travel in line with sustainability commitments. The opening follows a recent £1 million headquarters relocation to nearby Libertas House on St Vincent Place. The new flagship store was officially opened by Glasgow Chamber of Commerce Chief Executive Stuart Patrick with more than 100 attendees joining the event, including Barhead Travel Senior Management and staff, clients and travel suppliers, as well as MSPs Annie Wells and Cool Cab Stewart. Barhead Travel President Jacqueline Dobson said, With travel demand exceeding 2019 levels, we're pleased to be making significant investments in our team and retail locations. As more people return to travel agencies, we're ensuring our spaces are innovative, modern and accessible to all. She added, Although we are now a UK-wide business, Glasgow is our home and we are delighted to continue to invest in the city with offices and retail premises that will play an important role in skills development and job creation. Stuart Patrick, Chief Executive of Glasgow Chamber of Commerce, said, This is welcome news for Glasgow, as Barhead Travel's sustained growth amidst challenging conditions is extremely promising. Barhead Travel is a Glasgow business success story, which now operates UK-wide but continues to invest in our city centre, support jobs and the local economy. We wish them every success in their new premises. And that piece was written by Ian McConnell. Hello, this is your reader Jackie on Monday the 6th of March 2023. News. Zero emissions flights by 2030. Logan Air pioneers future flight. This article is by Vicky Allen. Scotland's largest regional airline says it expects the first small zero emission commercial flights to be operating across the country by the end of the decade. By 2040, the airline's goal is for all its fleets to be zero emissions aircraft. But more important than that, it expects to have played a globally significant role in the development of a new wave of aviation that is emissions-free. A revolution is starting in tiny Kirkwall Airport in Orkney. The Sustainable Aviation Test Environment, SAIT, project is nothing short of the development of a total system for zero emissions flights, a testing site for aircraft operating alongside an airline keen to design, trial and certificate new technology. A key element in that revolution is a small nine-seater aircraft, the Britain Norman Islander, which has been in use by Logan Air since 1967 and which could well be 
in its retrofitted form the first zero emissions commercial aircraft in Scotland. Logan Air is an active partner in three future flight projects taking place out of this site. Project Fresen is being led by Cranfield Aerospace Solutions to convert the Britain Norman Islander aircraft used on the Orkney Inter Isles Air Services to hydrogen fuel cell power, Zero Avia's hydrogen powered aircraft development, and Ampere electrical powered aircraft. These small aircraft are, according to Logan Air, Head of Sustainability Strategy Andy Smith, just the start. He said we'll see a commercial zero emissions aircraft flying in the UK before the end of this decade. The quicker the smaller aircraft convert, the quicker the larger aircraft convert. Airbus have made some big commitments to hydrogen. They are saying 2035 or earlier to have a hydrogen powered airline flying, which would be impressive. What is happening in Orkney is, according to one of its architects, unique in the world. Professor Andrew Ray of the University of the Highlands and Islands said our corner of Scotland is doing things that haven't happened anywhere before. They're developing infrastructure as well as the technology. And it's not just the airport, it's the airspace as well. It's people looking at new ways to manage the air above our heads so that these things can fly safely and not conflict with other users of airspace. It is also vital, as a 2021 study found aviation is responsible for 4% of human-induced global warming. If aviation growth was to continue at its current rate, it could contribute 0.1 degrees Celsius to global warming by 2050. There are reasons this remote island site is taking such a key role in the testing and development of the systems, supporting low emission flight. If you look at the south of England, airspace is very congested, Mr Smith said. It's not as good a place to be trying to work out trials. The fact that Orkney is a long way from anywhere is its advantage. You can test and you're not causing any issues with other airspace users. All three of Logan Air's partner projects are showing strong progress. In January, Zero Avia did its maiden flight of a hydrogen fuel cell aircraft. Mr Smith added, that's a big milestone, but there's a long way to go to having a certified product. Based on what we're being told by people who are developing these technologies, we're going for 2040 for zero emissions on all our fleet. It's an ambitious target, but we felt that we needed ambition. Currently, he said, Logan Air is open to all zero emissions technologies, which chiefly, for short haul, revolve around hydrogen and electric. Increasingly, however, hydrogen is being seen as the front runner. Hydrogen is currently looking like the most effective solution for us, said Mr Smith. Sustainable aviation fuels, which can be either biofuels or synthetic fuels, are very important for a global industry level and long haul flights, which are going to find it harder to decarbonise via hydrogen but we see that we can probably move quicker to net zero on our core operations by going down the hydrogen route. And that's just a feature of the fact that the aircraft we operate are a bit smaller and flying shorter distances. Hydrogen issues. One of the problems with hydrogen, Mr Smith added, is its large volume. He said to carry the same energy content as a jet fuel, you need to carry three times the volume and that's of liquid hydrogen at cryogenic temperatures. If it's gaseous, you're looking at six to seven times. Another is that it leaks. As Professor Ray put it, hydrogen is tricky stuff to keep hold of because it's a single atom molecule. It will leak from everything. You will need to deal with those leaks so they don't become dangerous. 
Nevertheless, developers are confident about conquering these challenges and even long-haul flights are looking to hydrogen. A Fly Zero study published by the Aerospace Technology Institute concluded that green liquid hydrogen is the optimum fuel for zero carbon emission flights and could power a mid-size aircraft with 280 passengers from London to San Francisco. Among the big challenges, Mr Smith said, is the supply of hydrogen. There are a lot of industries out there that are saying the only rational route for their decarbonisation is via hydrogen and everybody needs a bit of that chain for them to move. Energy supply is likely to represent the biggest challenge, whatever the source and technology. Professor Ray said whether it's electricity or sustainable aviation fuels, SAF, or hydrogen, production volumes will not be sufficiently currently to cope with aviation demand. There has to be significant infrastructure to generate hydrogen. With electricity, aviation is already competing against electric vehicles. Project demand for hydrogen, especially if it's competing with domestic heating, is orders of magnitude more than we have current capability for. Among Logan Air's partners is Cranfield Aerospace Solutions, whose project Fresen is taking a familiar small plane, the Britain Norman Islander, already in regular use for small island hops and installing hydrogen technology. Cranfield Aerospace is converting the aircraft to run on a fuel cell with gaseous hydrogen. Jennifer Kavanagh, its Chief Strategy Officer, described 2023 as a big year for Project Fresen. We are hoping to fly by the end of the year. End of Humanity Ms Kavanagh is acutely aware of the need for this technology to develop at pace. She added, there's a chance that if we don't do anything as a human race, that my children will see the end of humanity as we know it. The Islander was chosen, she said, partly because it was a cracking little aircraft, but also, she added, because of its small size and its operational use. The aircraft is part of a four-phase plan, scaling upwards in size. One of the reasons Logan Air has become a key player is that the airline operates a range of planes from tiny islanders to 50-seaters and above. Mr Smith said many of the technology providers wanted to start small and scale up. Generally, if you're an airline, you tend to operate aircraft of 20 seats and above or you operate 20 seats and below. But because of Logan Air's history, and we've run the Orkney Island inter-service for something like 50 years, we have that capability. Yet we're quite a large airline, so we have some management capability to be able to look at the sustainability issues. Because of its unique position, Mr Smith added, Logan Air felt an obligation. He said, if we don't do it, who will? It is also a necessity to maintain the connectivity of the islands. People often focus on the idea that flying is something only the wealthy do, a luxury, he said. But for Scotland, it's central to how these remoter communities and economies connect to the rest of the UK. So we have to find a solution. This article is by Vicky Allen. From the Herald, Sunday the 5th of March 2023. Aberdeen condemn fans who let the club down after Goodwin and Duncan incidents by Liam Bryce. Aberdeen have condemned fans who let the club down amid unsavoury incidents during Saturday night's win over Dundee United at Tannadice. The Dons teenage winger Ryan Duncan narrowly escaped being struck by a pyrotechnic device thrown onto the pitch by travelling supporters, while United manager an ex Don's boss, Jim Goodwin, was allegedly hit by missiles from the away end. Goodwin later said he was extremely disappointed after being targeted by that small few idiots during the first match in charge of his new club. 
The 41-year-old left his post at Pedodri in late January, following a dismal run of results, and he was subjected to verbal taunts throughout the team's 3-1 Premiership defeat. Aberdeen say they are now collaborating with United and Police Scotland to identify culprits and warn those responsible will be dealt with. A club statement issued on Sunday night also pleaded with fans to continue to give their side fantastic backing without endangering others. The statement said, The travelling support at Tanadice on Saturday night was impressive in both numbers and voice. Our away form has been disappointing this season, so it was an incredible turnout from Don's fans, and everyone at the club's hugely appreciative of the continued support and huge backing. However, regrettably, a handful of those have impacted the reputation of that amazing support. They've let the club and themselves down. Numerous pyrotechnic devices were ignited and thrown onto the pitch, with one narrowly missing Ryan Duncan. It's been reported that several objects were also thrown in direction of Jim Goodman. Inquiries have begun and we are working together with Dundee United and Police Scotland. If and when the culprits are identified, they'll be dealt with both by the club and by the authorities. Our plea to this minority is continue to give the team the fantastic support that we are known for, but do so in a safe and respectful manner that doesn't endanger either the health or safety of any players, staff or your own fellow supporters. That article was by Liam Bryce. From the Herald, Sunday the 5th of March, 2023. Sports section. Eilish McCoggan sets new British record for 10,000 metre race by Emma Sandliak, digital reporter. Scottish runner Eilish McCoggan has set a new British record in the 10,000 metres, taking just 30 minutes and 0.86 of a second to finish the track in California, beating a previous record set by Paula Radcliffe in Munich. Radcliffe held the record for over 20 years after clocking 30 minutes, 1.09 seconds in 2002. The 32-year-old Scott has now taken the record after a last-minute decision to race at the Sound Running 10 event. She adds a record to accolades already held in the 5,000 metres, 5 kilometres, 10 kilometres and half marathon. McColgan is currently training for the London Marathon and the record-breaking 10 kilometres comes after her first track race of 2023. She told Athletics Weekly, I am absolutely buzzing. Two years ago, I ran a big personal best here, so it's nice to be back with the crowds. I knew I was really in good shape, but to have it all come together on the day, it doesn't always happen. She added, I'm building up for the London Marathon and have had a few niggles and missed some prep races in January and a half marathon in February. But I'm really strong right now. I'm so glad I did it. Last year, the runner won gold at the Games in Birmingham to match her mother Liz McCoggan's gold at the 1986 Games in Edinburgh. At the time, Nicola Sturgeon tweeted, What an absolutely amazing night for Team Scotland. Congratulations to all our medal winners so far in these Commonwealth Games. Every medal is special, but what a tear in the eye to see Eilish McCoggan match her mum's 1986 gold. That article was by Emma Saliak. This article is from the Herald on Monday the 6th of March 2023. It's from the opinion section and the headline is Local Voices Must Be Heard in the Transition from Oil and the report is by Doug Marr. I've lived my entire life so far in the Aberdeen area. Hopefully I've gained some knowledge of the North East, its people and what makes us tick. Across more than seven decades, I've also witnessed the challenges and changes the region has faced. As a youngster, I remember the harbour and fish market with its rows of deep-sea trawlers stretching as far as the eye could see. Employment as a fish market porter was much sought after, often handed down within families. 
Harry Austin, an international player and the golden boy of Aberdeen's league-winning side of the 1950s, gave up the game to become a porter. I accompanied my engineer father to the bottom of Rubislaw Quarry, 140 metres deep and the source of granite for buildings around the world. A school trip took me to the Crombie textile mill that had manufactured uniforms for Confederate troops in the American Civil War. My uncle worked all his life at Hall Russell Shipyard and several friends found jobs at one of the local paper mills. What's the common factor in that self-indulgent stroll down memory lane? Simple. All those industries have gone to the wall. To be fair, by the 1960s, some were already on the slippery slope. The gradual decline of those traditional industries was accelerated by the discovery of North Sea oil and the city's identification as Europe's oil capital. Those of us with no connection to the industry viewed it with mixed feelings. We saw it for what it was, a mixed blessing. That judgment is confirmed by recent research by the University of Aberdeen Academics entitled Just Transition for Workers and Communities in Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire. The report describes the drawbacks as well as benefits of being the so-called oil capital. It also looks to the future and the next challenge facing the region, transitioning from the current unhealthy dependency on a single industry. Benefits identified in Just Transition include the reversal of population decline as workers from other areas and countries moved to the area. Relatively high wages both onshore and offshore are still an attraction. In our cul-de-sac of five houses, we are the only residents with no connection to the oil business. Further benefits included lower than average unemployment rates, all good stuff for those in the oil. But as late as 1988, wages for non-oil-related workers remained well below the British average. The academics cast doubt on whether oil capital status brought any net gain for local workers and communities. Any trickle-down largely bypassed local people and their communities, finding its way instead to central governments. Oil revenues camouflaged the disastrous UK economic policies of the Thatcher years. Revenues spent north of the border largely benefited the central belt. Precious little found its way back in terms of inward investment. A 2015 publication noted oil-related infrastructure costs were met almost entirely from our local rates and council taxes. In 1982, the area even lost its development area status, which wasn't restored, even when the oil price collapsed in 1986. Even today, the area still experiences the least generous financial settlements from the Scottish Government. Oil sounded the death knell for already ailing traditional industries. Inflated costs deterred non-oil businesses from relocating to the area. Increasingly, the local economy became a one-trick pony. The arrival of big oil displaced many smaller local businesses, meaning key economic decisions were taken outside the region. Multinational profits have done little to benefit Scotland and the North East in particular. Furthermore, locals were priced out of the housing market. For a time, only southern England had higher house prices. Superficial prosperity camouflaged growing social and economic inequality and pockets of severe deprivation. As recently as 2016, around 23% of the city's households were in fuel poverty. As its title suggests, Just Transitions looks ahead to the North East post-oil future. The Scottish Government's Joint Transition Fund is a step in the right direction. Next time, though, let's take more account of fairness, local rights, concerns and aspirations. That report was by Doug Marr. The Herald on the 7th of March and the Arts and Ends section. Scottish broadcaster STV feels pressure from advertising slowdown by Scott Wright. 
Shares in STV were down more than 2.5% in early trading this morning after the broadcaster signaled a gloomy near-term outlook for the advertising market. A Glasgow-based company reported that total advertising revenue had fallen by 2% to £110 million for the year to December 31 amid the uncertain economic climate and had subsequently fallen by 15% in the first quarter of 2023. Scottish advertising is expected to be down 20-25% in the first quarter, or to flat to slightly up when Scottish government spend is excluded, while total advertising revenue is forecast to be down 10-15% to in April, STV said. The broadcaster reported that adjusted operating profits were up 2% at £25.8 million in 2022, but total group revenue dropped by 5% to £137.8 million compared with 2021, with a decline attributed to the decrease in total advertising revenue and the timing of production deliveries. However, STV underlined the prospects for production's business. STV Studios, which has won 30 new commissions and 11 returning series, and it declared 2023 was shaping up to be a breakthrough year for the studios division, with £50 million of commissions already secured for delivery. Those include three major new returnable drama series currently in production for Apple, BBC and Channel 4. STV also highlighted the continuing expansion of its digital offer. Registered users of the STV player increased by 17% in 2022 to 4.9 million, with that number growing to more than 5 million in the first quarter of this year. STV Chief Executive Simon Pitts told The Herald this morning Of course, we are very mindful of the ongoing economic uncertainty. We are not immune from it going into 2023. You see that our total advertising revenues were down last year, but only by 2% to our second highest ever, in fact, and they were still comfortably ahead of the pre-COVID year of 2019. Q1 2023 advertising is down, but even then we are seeing some encouraging signs, with Scottish SME advertising slightly up in the first quarter, digital advertising slightly up and around 20% ahead, and of course we have been here many times before. We have seen the advertising market bouncing back quickly from any economic shocks because TV advertising, in our view, remains the most effective way of building a brand. That was by Scott Wright. That concludes this week's edition of the Herald Scotland podcast. Please remember to subscribe to our channels at Kuhn Review and to tell your friends about our service.